You are listening to the Intelligent Racer Podcast, where we look to educate and entertain the endurance racing community through discussions with racing professionals and elite age groupers. In today's episode, I speak with Matt Flaherty. He is a professional runner, coach, and freelance writer. We talk about some of his favorite races and also discuss his coaching approach and philosophy. I hope you enjoy. Matt, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? Good. Thanks for having me, Adam. Let's start off with your background in running. How did you get started in running and how did you ultimately decide to turn pro? Kind of a long story, of course. I mean, I've been running for 20 plus years. I'm uh, 31 years old now and I went out in sixth grade and started running in junior high and just, you know, kind of fell in love with the sport and, and really had a lot of fun with the team aspect of it. I don't think I was in love with running from the start because, uh, you know, kind of who at 11 or 12 really is. I competed through junior high and high school in, in central Illinois where I grew up and before I really realized it had become a very big part of who I was. I did fairly well at that level, but not, uh, you know, top of the state or anything. I made it to the state meets, but I don't think I was ever all state and really didn't plan to run in college. But after I got to uh, the University of Illinois, where I uh, kind of headed for engineering school, realized within a few months there that I, that I really missed running uh, competitively and wanted to be on the team and all of that. So I uh, kind of got to work that year and, and ended up walking on as a sophomore at Illinois and, and ran three years there. After that, I uh, came down to Indiana University uh, for law school uh, in Bloomington, Indiana, which is actually where I currently live, and kind of got involved in marathons straight away. Um, I, I, I'm the kind of runner who's always been better the longer the distance, so uh, you know, pretty quickly uh, moved up and ran a serious marathon in 08, my first like real attempt at the distance. Um, was down in St. Louis. That was a year out of college, and I ran 226, uh, which was... Uh, I faded a bit at the end of that race, but it was really a pretty good performance uh, for uh, my serious marathon debut. And spent the next several years uh, while I was in law school, kind of chasing that marathon time, trying to approach the, the Olympic trial standard, which uh, at the time was initially 2:22, and then I think dropped to 2:19. And kind of in retrospect, I was uh, stubbornly chasing that a little too much. I should have been just trying to improve my time, you know, running the 2:24 next time out or something, instead of trying to make too big of a leap. Uh, so kind of had a little bit of stagnation in terms of results over those next few years. And then as it happened, right around 2010, ended up hopping in an ultra marathon. So uh, I think I'd seen an ad for the North Face 50 Mile Trail Championship out in California. And uh, it seemed like it was a very competitive race and, and uh, beautiful and decided to hop to give it a shot. I think by that point, I'd been running maybe, you know, 28 or 30 mile runs in training anyway, um, experimenting with different types of training for the marathon. So I was like, okay, well, 50 miles isn't that far. Um, <laughs> I'll give it a shot. But what I didn't really realize is how much uh, vertical gain there was in that race. I think it's like 10,000 feet of climbing or something. And right, uh, yeah. for a guy coming from the Midwest, it was really hard to uh, <laughs> handle. Actually, the downhills were the, were the thing that took me out in the end. I was running fairly competitively in that first race, and then the quads kind of imploded, and I and I fell apart. Uh, <laughs> but it was uh, I kind of got bit by the trail bug then. I'd, I'd always been running on trails, always loved hiking you know, in national parks, and kind of grew up running around the woods and stuff. So it's always been a part of who I am but uh, I didn't realize that there was much of a competitive side to it until then. That was kind of my entrance into that aspect of the sport. And, you know, like I said, I'd always been running on trails and now I was competing on them and really loved that. And uh, I guess uh, to kind of take it to where I you know, decided to kind of make a go at running professionally, right after law school in 2010, I moved up to Chicago to work uh, for a law firm uh, up there doing kind of some patent litigation work. And it was pretty busy uh, and also just, kind of dominated your life. It was, uh, you kind of just had to be available at any time to go in and work on things. And, and I was still running and trying to run well, but my mileage was not very high. And I, I was having some solid results, but knew it just wasn't going to last um, if given the kind of current situation that I was in. And while I liked the work, at least intellectually, like there were a lot of other cultural things about uh, big law in general and the firm I was at that I didn't, I knew I didn't want to be a part of long term. So those kind of things coincided and, and I decided to take a leap and, and quit the job after a year and change and kind of go all in on the running. I, I just had a couple of good races in um, the next few ultra marathons I tried and was able to get some sponsorship opportunities. Um, joining Solomon uh, at the end of 2011 is kind of my main sponsor that I've been with since then, uh, along with a couple others and decided, okay, um, I'm going <laughs> to make a full-time go with this. Uh, I think I was a little naive in thinking that like, if I ran really well, that I would get enough money from sponsors and prize money to like really fully support myself. Uh, and then compounding that naivete was the fact that I got injured almost immediately after um, 
I quit my law job. So that was kind of unfortunate and took actually like 10 months to get over an Achilles issue. So uh, it was kind of a slow start to the the so-called professional career. Um, But that was helpful in a way because it helped me to realize that I needed to do other things kind of to help make ends meet. And uh, that's when I got involved more formally in coaching as well as writing for for magazines uh, on a freelance basis. When I talk to people about what I do, uh, you know, cocktail party kind of conversation, I just say that I make my living in, in the sport of running and kind of explain what I mean by that. And, and you know, that I wear a number of different hats. Uh, so it's not all full-time running as performance, but it's all uh, kind of related, uh, the coaching, the writing, the running. Uh, so that's kind of where I am now. I've been doing this uh, in some capacity in that form, I guess, since 2012. I quit my job as an attorney and um, almost almost five years now. So Yeah, I was going to say, um, I really like your story because it's sort of similar to mine, which is I went to business school, went into investment banking, which is the similar uh, kind of route as mm-hmm. big law, <laughs> and it was no balance, worked all the time, never exercised, and I was miserable. <laughs> yeah. So so I, I yeah. left that. And, and, I, and actually, after that, I took up triathlons and got more active and stuff. I, I, I nice. didn't turn pro, but, it, but at the same time, I can relate. And I think it's, uh, you know, for most people probably listening to this uh, podcast uh, can probably relate as well as it's hard to balance life, but, uh, you know, being, sure. out, being outdoors and running or, or whatever the activity is, it's really important. So, um, you yeah. know, you know, so you've had success at the marathon distance as well as other distances, you know, 50 milers, things like that. I mean, help compare for me tactically. I mean, how do you approach a marathon versus that, like a 50 miler, um, you know, from a sure. race perspective? Yeah. I mean, it's not just distance, it's terrain and competition and all sorts of things. What I, what I tell people sometimes is that like, Road running can get a little boring for me because, and I think for anybody, because there's really not a ton of tactics involved unless you're actually winning races. Uh, and that's, I've had a few races like that, you know, whether it was uh, in Chicago when I was, you know, running fairly competitively on the road scene there or, or whatever. But by and large, when you run a, a road race, marathons included, to, to maximize your performance, it's just basically like run intelligent pacing and like be tough. And that's pretty much it. It's like try to even or slightly negative split because we know that's optimal for like performance and then just like be mentally tough (laughs) when it gets hard. And that's pretty much the formula for success. And again, unless you're like actually leading and winning a marathon in a competitive race, like you aren't going to be in these, in a position to where you're having to surge and like play these tactical games, you know, like you, like you would maybe uh, see at the front. So that to me, like, <laughs> can get a little bit boring. Uh, I still like marathons and other distance races, and like performing well and running fast. But that stuff to me is at its best when it's actually like a truly competitive. Um, so I like hopping in all sorts of shorter distance races, and you know, I'll, I'll do really anything: cross country, indoor track, whatever. I hope to hop in a few indoor track races this winter. Um, you know, for an example, like three or four years ago, I hopped in a three thousand meter indoor track race that against the you know a couple of collegiate club kids and like I was in no had no business like racing 3,000 meters and uh they were you know fit and ready to go and the three of us were like leading and I knew they were not kicking me they were younger they were faster they were sharp and I was like okay well tactically what do I do here I'm thinking this during the race like how do I try to at least take a shot at winning this I was like I gotta make a long drive from like five left out and just like see what happens and like try to break them and like that's what I attempted and it didn't work and they beat me (laughs) but like that to me is much more interesting than just like time trialing. So a lot of times the road running scene in particular can like kind of just be time trialing. When you really do get into those competitive races, it's awesome. Uh, and I love that tactical element. But you don't see it a ton. Whereas ultra marathons are really interesting tactically, especially when they're trail races, because everybody's bringing a different skill set to the game. And there are just way more factors going into like your performance than let's say a road marathon again, where basically it's like run good splits and be tough. Uh, so in an ultra, for instance, like you've got like technical trail skill, you've got climbing ability, you've got descending ability, you've got, you know, ability to like handle nutrition well and hydrate well and plan well logistically. There's a pacing element too. There's much more of an element of like, you can try to break somebody on a climb or like get out of sight or do whatever, you know? So it's, uh, tactically tends to be more interesting. And I think that's, pretty neat everybody approaching ultra running is kind of coming from a different background so when you move up in distance from like 50k to 100k say like somebody who's much more of a you know just spends long days in the mountain might be way stronger and and have a you know better chance at a race like that you know versus a 50k when speed 
comes into account a little bit more and, and, you know, it favors guys who can also run a fast marathon or something. So, uh, kind of short answer. I mean, it really depends, uh, on the type of race, whether it's trail, what, you know, what you're dealing with as to how the tactics differ. But I think by and large, like in general, ultra marathons, especially trail ultra marathons tend to be more interesting tactically for that reason. Uh, just because you've got such a, a wide variety of athletes and a wide variety of skills necessary to like succeed in that, in those types of events. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that absolutely does. And, and I think that's a, the appeal to, uh, you know, trail running and, and ultra races is that tactical piece and, and really it's yeah, definitely uh, part of it. Yeah, for sure. So let's talk about some of your race highlights. Um, you know, in the last sure. few years, uh, why don't we start off with the Cayuga trails 50? And the, the reason I bring that up is, um, you know, I, I went to school up in Ithaca and I got married up there. So that town's pretty close to my heart. So I always, when people do races up there, I like to kind of highlight them and just talk about it because it's such a beautiful area. So why don't you, if you don't mind, just kind of explain the race a little bit and, and, you know, maybe give us that course highlights or, or whatever. I would love to hear about it. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's a race that I really like a lot. Um, it's put on by Ian Golden, uh, who's the owner of the running store up there, um, Finger Lakes Running Company. And it's only, uh, I think a four year old race. He got it started in, in, uh, I guess 2013, I think. Uh, so it'll be coming into his fifth year and he has a whole series up there called, um, uh, red new racing. They've got like 10 to 12 races throughout the year. And Ian just does a ton of, of good work for that community, um, in terms of putting on quality events and, and that type of thing. So, uh, I kind of got involved just the first year they were doing it. Um, Ian, you know, wisely was sort of recruiting for the event. He was trying to get to be competitive and, and was sending messages out to people. And, and um, when he sent me a message, it was like eight months in advance of the race. I was still injured and just kind of thinking, okay, well, I don't have anything on the schedule. Maybe I'll go do it. So uh, I told him I would, and then I ended up being healthy and went out there. And so I've been to the race three out of the four years it's been uh, run. And that first year I got second place to Sage Canada. Uh, the third year, I think, I, or the second year I ran it, I, I got a third, and I got a third again this year. Apart from the first year, it's been the U.S. 50 Mile Trail Championships every year, so that helps uh, draw some top competition, uh, both kind of do the prize money, the prestige of a championship, and also it's been a qualifying race then for the trail running ultra world championships if you win that race. So uh, it's been really cool to to run against some competitive uh, guys there and also just get to experience Ithaca running culture. So because I've been three times, I've really gotten to know a lot of the folks in the area now um, who are members of the different clubs. Uh, running clubs in Ithaca or Rochester or wherever it is, and that kind of come to this race every year. Uh, this is kind of like maybe one of the more competitive events in New York uh, in terms of trail and mountain ultra that will actually draw some national level competition. And um, it's been a lot of fun to be involved. So I think Ian just does an awesome job, and I think the trail itself is really great. So it ends up being like two 25 mile out and back slash like lollipop kind of things that are running on these different trails, uh, really just right outside of Ithaca. And if you don't know anything about Ithaca, obviously you do, but <laughs> listeners, um, it's got these gorges uh, outside of town and, and really through town that are really beautiful. So these kind of like cascading waterfalls with uh, stairs and, and things that climb the gorge uh, is kind of the highlight of the trail. Um, so you get to see that a lot. And just a really uh, kind of diverse and, and challenging course and, and really well-run event. So it's been a lot of fun to be a part of that and uh, definitely recommend it for folks. I have tentative plans to go back again this year. Uh, it's definitely one of my favorite races I've done and kind of uh, better ones that I've seen on, on the circuit. So uh, yeah, it's a good one. Very cool. So I also saw, I think the last two years you've done a race at, I guess a 90 K in Sweden. Uh, what's that about? I haven't heard about that one. So it looked yeah, interesting. Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, so I was on another podcast earlier this year and, and someone was asking me like why I choose to go back to an event or not. And, um, it can, you know, number of factors, of course, but it gets back to kind of what I was just talking about with Cayuga Trail is that, you know, when an event is well run, when a community around it is really good and when the director does a really good job, uh, especially for the elite athlete side uh, and, and supports that, like, I appreciate that. And like, it's it's a bunch of factors, but it, but there's a handful of races I've done that, that I really enjoy and will continue to go back to a number of times. And this one in Sweden is another one of them. It's called the Ultra Vatsen, uh 90K. And I wrote a report about it last year for, for ultra running magazine. I think that's probably out there online somewhere. And, um, it's an interesting race because it is on a cross country ski race route. Um, that, that is called the Vasa Lapet is the, the cross country skiing race. And it's the oldest and biggest and most competitive ski race in the world. So it's like right around a hundred years old and like 80,000 people do this ski race every winter. 
Uh, it's pretty crazy. <laughs> and they have like, you know, very serious prize money and all that. And, uh, just recently, they started doing a bike race and a running race in the summer on the same route, uh, which is a point-to-point 90-kilometer uh, trail um, up in kind of like central Sweden. Uh, and it's got this unique historical element that uh, it is the route that the founding king of Sweden, um, Gustav Vasa, like skied to like rally these people uh, from that region to go fight the Danish king and, and claim independence. So it's like very tied to Swedish history. Um, which is why the race got started uh, on that route to begin with. And um, while the running race is only three years old, uh, they've got a ton of infrastructure um, built around the ski race, you know, including like full-time year-round employees and that sort of stuff. And it's just really well done. So I got to know the director of that race, um, Peter Fredrickson, uh, through my involvement in a couple of the world championship 100 kilometer events. Um, He's kind of like the Swedish team manager and coach when they come to those events. So I got to know Peter uh, he invited me to the race, and I've gotten to kind of really know the whole Swedish uh, ultra running team and sweet uh, scene from that, from doing that race a couple of years. And I'm not sure if I'll be back this year or not, but I know I'll be back in the future. Um, it's just a really pretty trail and a really well organized and well run event. And and Peter does a lot to. They're really trying to grow it. They're trying to be like the Comrades um, Ultra Marathon of trail. So cool. Comrades is a big road event in South Africa, and and they're trying to be like the trail equivalent, where they're going to try to get you know thousands and thousands of people on this course. And it does have like the infrastructure to handle that because you've got 80,000 people skiing it. Um, kind of a, a mixture of, of wide fire road stuff, some single track, um, overall pretty runnable, pretty fast, but really, really beautiful. I've also got some family in Sweden, um, distant family that I visited when I've been there. So that's kind of another, you know, carrot bringing me back. And then this year I actually got to travel around in Norway and Sweden for a while afterwards too. And that was incredible. Norway, especially it was one of like the most beautiful places I've ever been. So that's another reason to go back and spend more time in Norway post race, uh, because it's just a really pretty part of the world. So yeah, that's been a fun one. And and another one I definitely recommend. And one of my other favorites, uh, out of all the races I've done, I would say. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, uh, one of the nice side, uh, thing or side effects of uh, of having like a endurance hobby or, or profession is you can travel uh, along with it and see some amazing beautiful places. Oh, for sure. So yeah, and that's part of the appeal of like mountain ultra trail generally. I think not just you know we talked about the competitive and, and tactical element and that sort of thing, but like especially for maybe folks who aren't as competitive. And, and I know this will be me eventually. Uh, you know, just running in beautiful areas, the opportunity to run you know beautiful trails and beautiful parks is really nice, uh, and it's nice to have to be able to cover 50, 50 miles or hundred K or hundred miles, you know, by your own power and have that, uh, community and support behind you to make it possible. Obviously you could do that as like an adventure run too, but it's kind of cool to be able to do it as racing and push yourself a little harder than you could otherwise. And just see these really, really beautiful natural areas. Uh, so yeah, both in the racing and running and also kind of, you know, the travel to these spots and being able to engage with those, you know, wilderness areas post race is a lot of fun. Absolutely. Um, I guess one more race question before we move on. Um, you sure. mentioned that you, there are certain races you like to return to uh, for various reasons. Are there any other races besides the two we just talked about that are kind of highlights for you or ones that y- you would recommend people look into that you, you love and have a special connection with? It depends where you're coming from, of course. I, I've always been drawn to some of the historical races uh, that have been around longest. So like the oldest ultra in the U.S. is the JFK 50 mile and um, Hagerstown, Maryland. I think that's, you know, a bucket list must run kind of for, for ultra runners in the U S it's not everybody's cup of tea, but it's cool. The history that, that's been there and Mike Stenler, the RD does a good job. Um, ice age 50 mile in, in Wisconsin is another one that's been around since the early eighties. And that's kind of my, when I think of it as my backyard ultra, cause I got started when I was in Chicago and that was kind of the closest and oldest one. So that one's definitely got a special place in my heart. And then really a lot of the races that have just been around a long time. I mean, there's new, cool new races too but like the ones that are established tend to have a unique kind of local cultural component to them because they've been going on for a while and if they've survived this long they've probably got a good thing going so just two others that i ran in the last year that i thought were pretty neat and been around for some time and, and have a cool vibe around them is that the the mountain mist 50k in, in huntsville alabama um that's the in january and then also the chicken up 50k up in uh, Bellingham, Washington, I thought was really cool. The Bellingham community was great, and the trail was awesome. Chrissy Mail, the, the race director up there, that's another really cool one. So, Sure, absolutely. So let, let's uh, talk about your coaching now. Um, so you said you, you started coaching you know, early on in, in terms of when you really decided to um, you know, take running as a profession. So can you just, just describe a little bit about your coaching philosophy and approach and, and, and how you go about things uh, from that perspective? 
Yeah, for sure. So, uh, you know, I've just by way of background, I mean, I've always been a very curious person uh, in the sport and like very much a student of the sport. So, I mean, since junior high, I've been picking my coaches' brains and had a lot of good coaches through high school and college and stuff and learned a ton from all of them. And really for about a year right out of college, I was coached then also by um, a buddy's dad who was a very competitive uh, runner and hit, actually still is, but <laughs> uh, through his whole career and learned some from him. And then in about 08, kind of branched out on my own and started applying what I'd learned. And, and then a year or so after that, folks started asking me if I'd coach them or, you know, give them guidance for a race. So that's kind of how I got involved informally in it. And I'd been doing that long enough and um, had the success, you know, just working with people casually that, yeah, when I started, you know, to uh, run full time in 2012, I decided to, you know, make it a business and, and uh, get involved in it in that way a little more formally. And that's been really cool. I've probably coached, I don't know, around a hundred people or so over the last uh, five or six years. And um, I guess what, you know, like it's been great to coach that many people and, and kind of see an opportunity to work with folks coming from all different situations and apply, you know, my, there are definitely philosophies that are kind of overarching and that I think apply to everyone, but every individual client is, is a, you know, a unique puzzle and uh, coming from their own place. So the biggest thing is like to have quality coaching, it's got to be customized, it's got to be personal, and it's got to have a feedback loop where you can change things and alter things based on how the training is actually going. It can't just be, I mean, even if you, so one thing I won't do, I don't, Take, I won't like write a schedule for someone and then leave it at that. Like uh, some folks have like, you know, contacted me wanting me to just write a personal schedule for four months that they follow to a race and that's it as opposed to like regular coaching. And I won't do it because it's like not, it's not a good service, you know, because any, any good coaching needs to have that ability to change and tweak things when stuff doesn't go exactly to plan or when it goes better than plan or whatever the case may be. Right. So while giving someone a personalized plan would be better than just taking like a cookie cutter thing from a book or a website. It's still very far from ideal. To me, the importance of coaching is like really needs to be like regular communication and ability to tweak and alter things based on actual results and how things are going as well as, you know, just this simple how to restructure things when you get overly busy or you come down with a cold for a week or whatever it may be. Um, so that flexibility uh, and communication is, is really like, really informs like the way I coach and everything I do in that regard. Um, speaking a little more broadly to like philosophy, um, I believe, I guess, pretty strongly in, in both like periodization of training and also specific, like specificity is like really important to me. It's, it's, and that can mean a lot of things. So like when it comes to marathon and sub marathon distances, like specific training tends to have to do with distance and pace. Uh, so if we're training for say a marathon and we want to maximize your potential, the last couple months before the race, we really need to be hammering marathon pace in training. 90% of your workouts need to be at or near marathon pace. That's a mistake a lot of people make. They kind of treat a marathon like a like any other race. They just do the regular speed work tempo and then maybe a longer, long run. I think that's good marathon training. It's not horrible. I mean, you could do worse, but it's not marathon training either. That's just, you know, ramping up your long run isn't going to maximize your potential because you're not honing your fitness specifically to the race at hand, the task at hand. You're, you're just kind of getting fit and then running a marathon. So to, that's something I, I think most folks uh, who haven't had formal coaching or don't have a, a lot of background in this probably make a mistake. They think, oh, I'm doing these different types of workouts, so I'm hitting all these different boxes and everything's going to be just fine. And that's really the approach you should be taking more three, four, or five months out from a race when you're trying to build your fitness, get in good general shape, uh, what I would call fundamental uh, training or fundamental phase of training, and then taking that last couple of months and, and really doing specific work and, and uh, tailoring your workouts to the specific race at hand. And that's going to give you, you know, the specific muscular endurance as well as the, the meta metabolic changes and other things you need to maximize your potential at a particular race distance and effort. And with culture running, it gets a little bit different because it's not, it's impossible to run the distance. Or I mean, it'd be well ill-advised anyway to run the distances uh, that, you know, in training that we're going to be running and racing. Um, so specificity starts to mean a little bit different things. It can mean it's really important, especially in trail ultra running to make sure that you're hitting the type of terrain, uh, both from a technical standpoint and from a, um, vertical gain standpoint that you're going to see in racing. So if you're doing a, if you're preparing for a 50 mile race, you know, that has 10,000 feet of gain 
and you're doing a 30 mile training run as one of your big training efforts, that training run needs to have six or 7,000 feet of vertical gain in it, ideally, right. uh, so that you can mirror the type of things you're going to see in the race. Obviously, also with, with ultra running, you've got these other logistical components to practice and, and skills to work on, whether it's um, you know hammering some downhill reps to condition your quads to the eccentric loading that they're going to ha- have, or practicing nutrition stuff, and making sure you've got that worked out. Uh, so there's different pieces of the puzzle, and, and specificity means different things in different contexts. Yeah, I guess one other uh, coaching question, which I actually haven't asked on the, on this show very often, but I think is important, is for a runner looking for a coach, what what would you recommend the process be in, in terms of like someone contacts you, curious about learning about how you coach? I mean, should they ask about the coaching style, the the program? What how how should they go about thinking about that? Yeah, that's that's a good question, and uh, and, and one that doesn't have an easy answer. I mean, it's because there's so many different people kind of doing this on a very loose basis. Like there, there are certifications out there, for instance, through USATF or uh, Red Runners Club of America and stuff. And people can get these certifications and tout those. And that might be a very loose, pro- you know, proxy of like, okay, this is like a sign that someone is committed to this or knows something, but I, I don't have any of those certifications, for instance, and I haven't gotten them because I know that they're fairly useless. I've talked to the people who have them. The USATF one, for instance, in particular, the level one certification is like, you know, whatever, three or four hundred dollars in like three days of like nonstop classes where you get, I mean, you learn about uh, hurdling and, and you know, throwing and all these things that would be totally irrelevant for a distance coach. Right. You only spend three hours on distance training or endurance training. And like only like a small part of that has anything to do with the, the events I'm even working with. And it's like literally the most basic thing, you know, that I, I knew and had learned, you know, when I was 12 years old. So it's like, uh, the certifications aren't particularly useful. So I don't think that's a great way necessarily to tell who's a good coach. Uh, I think you can look at results a little bit and like testimonials and that's a good way uh, maybe to find, you know, and and even just word of mouth. So like, um, you know, asking around among friends or people in your community, you know, if they've had coaching experiences and who, who they like, but I mean, athletes have come to me, you know, have found me through Googling or because they follow my running career or whatever it is. And in other cases, you know, recommended or, or uh, referred to me by friends. But yeah, it's, it's striking a little bit. I think it, it's a bit of a daunting process when you want to find a running coach. You don't know of anyone in particular, like figure out how to find someone and who's good and, and all that sort of stuff. So it's not an easy process to figure out. Um, I would say that like, I've been shocked by like how many people I've talked to who have had coaching experiences with others that were like, they their coach won't get back to them or they won't have a schedule like yeah. <laughs> ready you know for, for their, and, and like weird stuff like that so if anything like that's going on like that's definitely not a good fit um and when you're approaching coaching i would say like yeah like just talk to the talk to the coach you know and ask any questions you have make sure that like just just ask the details of like how they run things uh you know how they're going to personalize your training what informs their you know how they're writing a schedule for you that it's not, you know, just a cookie cutter thing that's the same for everybody. And, and, you know, maybe just have some questions about their background and all that. And I think you'll get a, you know, any coach who is serious is, will be willing to have like a consultation phone call or email exchange or something like that, right. uh, either for free or for a very nominal fee, you know, and if they don't, that's maybe not a good fit. You know, like I think any coach who really knows what they're doing is happy to talk about why they're doing what they're doing. And I had a college coach who used to say that. He was like, you know, anytime you have a question uh, about why we're doing something, just ask. He's like, if I can't answer that, that's a problem. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I need to, uh, there's a reason for everything I have you doing, so so uh, feel free to ask that. So, yeah, just getting in touch with the coach and, and asking detailed questions about, you know, what the process is like. And I think, you know, if you just go through those steps, you'll get a, a feel and vibe for like what a coach is going to be like, if it's going to be in a good fit. So yeah, you know, explore those options and maybe try talking to a few people just to, uh, you know, get a, get a sense of what might be a good fit for you. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, the consultation piece is really important. One of the things that really kind of stuck out when you said before that someone approached you and said, hey, I just want a plan. I don't want the feedback loop or anything like that. And you said, yeah, that's not that's not the right match. That's not what I want to do. That's that's important yeah. to find out because you want to ha- have that kind of feedback loop. That's the key to coaching. And and so sure, um, sure. so, that, you know, you're only going to find that out, though, through those conversations. So that that's a really, really good point. So one final question. Um, what's next yeah. for you? I, I, I think I saw an on uh, social media that you're heading to New Zealand in uh, early yeah. next year for hundred K. What, what else is on, on tap? You want, can you talk about that for a second? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Uh, kind of still figuring things out. You know, I've always got 
I've got long-term plans and races I want to do ultimately like down the line, like Western States and UTMB and things like that, but no rush to jump into them. And then I've got, you know, kind of loose plans for me for 2017. And uh, yeah, the one that's for sure on the horizon is uh, the Tarawira Ultra Marathon. It's a 102K trail race in uh, Rotorua, New Zealand. And that's, it's been a pretty competitive one. Winners the last few years have been um, Dylan Bowman, Tish Canada, uh, Jonas Bood, who's a 100K world champion from Sweden. Um, so Always competitive race. Uh, they they seem to do a really good job. I've only heard like rave reviews from everybody everybody who's been there, and um, they have some level of support for some international athletes that you can apply for. And I applied uh, this year and wasn't super sure I'd get anything, but they were able to give me some support. Uh, so that helps me to you know get there and and race. And uh, definitely very excited to go do that. So that's February 11th, I think. So coming up really pretty quickly. Got to get <laughs> get back two things here and get get a get back training. Um, so that's first on the horizon, and then. I'd also like to run the Boston Marathon in the spring. I, um, I went there in 2014 for the first time and ran my PR um, of 221 at, at Boston that year. And uh, was really kind of just training for an ultra marathon at the time. I mean, I'd done some, you know, workouts, but it wasn't, it definitely wasn't optimal marathon specific training. So I'd love to go back to Boston and take a little more of like a proper shot at a, at a fast time there and do a little bit more marathon specific work in, in my build up. Of course, you know, I've always got my eye on, you know, about ultra racing and that sort of stuff too. So it's not going to be a hundred percent focused on Boston, but I think, you know, if things go well between now and then, and, and I can stay healthy and uh, all that, you know, optimally can maybe go to 18 to 19, something like that at, at uh, Boston this year and would love to take a shot there. So I've been in touch with them and, and I uh, still need to get that finalized and squared away. And then still thinking a little bit about maybe doing the comrades marathon in the spring too. So that's like late May or early June. And uh, same thing. I haven't, uh, actually reached out to the, the folks I need to reach out to there yet, but that would be a potential sort of finish to my first half of the year if I did the uh, Tarot Weaver on New Zealand, then the Boston Marathon, and then the Comrades Marathon. Those are all kind of like six to nine weeks apart. Um, if you kind of build through and have enough time to recover, but then kind of build up and, and have a good result at each of those, and then maybe take a little break in the month of June after those. So if I could actually get all those three squared away and, and do that, that'd be kind of my optimal spring season, I think. And then, but you know, there's always so many different opportunities. So if, if one of those or two of those doesn't work out for some reason or another, there's so many other cool races I could hop in. Cayuga Trail that we talked about, that's a possibility still if I don't go do comrades. And then there's, there's others too. So uh, that's kind of where my thoughts are right now. And beyond that, not, not a whole lot planned further into the future, just kind of some bucket list races I'd like to take on eventually. But Cool. Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna ask before about uh, Western states or or something in the future because you're a historian and love historical races with a lot of tradition. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I was like, that's got to be. Yeah, up you got to do those. <laughs> um, well, anyway, yeah, sure. uh, um, Matt, thank you so much for your time today, and, and thanks yeah, for sharing absolutely. a little bit about your race experiences and your coaching philosophy and stuff. I think it was really interesting. So thank you so much. Sure thing. Yeah, thanks for having me on the podcast. Thanks for listening to the Intelligent Racer Podcast. For more information on this and other episodes, please visit www.intelligentracer.com. Also, be sure to check us out on social media and please review us on your podcast directory. Join us next time for another edition of the Intelligent Racer.